hey guys, in this video the lovely Tim is going to be taking you through the process of forgetting. This is for your A-level psychology. Now you do not want to forget the process of forgetting, oh god I'm sorry, I promise I'm going to stop with these awful cheesy cheesy puns soon. But to make sure that you don't forget all of this over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions to help you revise. psychologists, and indeed most people generally, make a very straightforward assumption about the process of forgetting. They assume that if you're unable to retrieve any single specific memory, then it's been forgotten forever. It's permanently gone. On the surface, at least, this seems like a logical assumption. If you can't remember something, then you must have forgotten it. That's usually what we mean when we say forgotten. Forgetting information that was stored in our short-term memory seems to be an issue of availability. This information is no longer available because the short-term memory, as we've already seen, has both a limited duration and limited capacity. By that we mean it can't hold that much information, it has a limit on how much information it can hold, and it can't hold information for very long, it has an upper limit on its capacity. This information may have been what we call displaced. It may have been pushed out by new information that we've taken in since we took the initial information in. It may also have decayed. It may have gradually faded away over time. Availability is an issue that can also affect our long-term memories. But being able to recall something from LTM can also be caused by a couple of other issues. The first of these is accessibility. Accessibility is when the information is still there. It's present still in our long-term memory, but the brain is having issues retrieving it. It may need help, like a cue or a trigger, to access this, that memory. This is an availability or an accessibility issue. Interference is the second problem with long-term memory. When we say interference, what we mean is that the information is still there. It's still present in our long-term memory, but the brain has got it intermingled and confused with other information. This causes the memory to be vague, confusing, and half-remembered. There are several explanations for the process of forgetting, how we forget, and how that process of forgetting can be limited or controlled. The first of these explanations is called interference theory. Interference theory says that our ability to remember information depends on the information we have taken in before and the information that we've taken in since. This is known as interference, and there are two distinct variations, two different types of interference. We call them retroactive interference and proactive interference. We'll look at these in a lot more detail slightly later on. This theory, called interference theory, is supported by many experiments and studies. It has empirical evidence backing it up of a scientifically supportive nature, done thoroughly and repeatedly and peer-reviewed. It meets the scientific standard of evidence. However, most of these are laboratory studies. When we do a laboratory study, we have good control of the variables. There's a very small chance that a third uncontrollable outside variable may be affecting our results, but doing our study in a laboratory minimizes that chance. However, a second effect of doing laboratory studies, as many of these were, is that they have limited ecological validity. They may not apply particularly well in the actual real world outside of the lab. There is some real-world evidence for interference. For example, you may find it hard to remember how to play the violin if you later learn to play the piano. Interference theory explains why we forget, but it goes no further than that. It provides no cognitive brain function or neurological explanation for why interference actually happens. It just says it happens and then gives it as one possible explanation for the process of forgetting. So although the theory has a lot of evidence, some real world and some in a lab, it is limited in that respect. The first type of interference is called retroactive interference. Retroactive interference is when new or recent information causes our brains problems in recalling older or less recent information. Underwood and Postman in 1960 carried out a study which gave some support and some evidence to this theory of retroactive interference. This study was done under laboratory conditions, so there was good control of the variables. Participants were then divided into two groups. Both groups were given a set of paired words to learn, like dog bark, tree leaf, walk pace. One group of the two was then given a second list of pair words, which shared the first word in each pair with the initial list, such as dog paw, tree branch, walk boot. They've been given a second list, so that is more recent or newer information than the initial first list. 
Both of these groups were then tested, and they were tested on their ability to recall only the first list they were given. Remember, one group was just given that list, and another group was given another one afterwards. They were given the first word in each pair as a trigger. So in the example that I've used here, they would be given dog, tree, and walk. The group that had been given a second list to memorize found the recall much harder. They struggled much more to remember the pairs of words. This suggested that retroactive interference had happened. The new information that they'd been given in the second list, especially because it was related to the first list and shared a few similarities, had interfered with their ability to recall that initial list. A retroactive interference had occurred, causing them to at least partially forget. Proactive interference is similar but different. In many ways, it's the opposite. It's a mirror image of retroactive interference. Proactive interference is when older information that is already memorized interferes with our ability to remember new information. In 1997, Underwood did meta-analysis on memory studies. Meta-analysis is analyzing the collective results of a range of past studies to try and identify overall trends, patterns, or even inconsistencies, effectively a review of past research, very complex and takes a very long time. Underwood found that if people had learned 15 or more word lists within 24 hours a single day, their recall of the final list learned was only about 20%. They could only recall about one-fifth of the words. However, in contrast, people who had only memorized a single list within that 24-hour period had recall of this one sole list of about 80%, so four-fifths. Underwood therefore made a conclusion. The conclusion was that previously learned lists had interfered with the ability of participants to recall the final list. This was pr proactive interference at work. Older information had prevented them from efficiently recalling newer information. And this study, or at least this meta-analysis of studies, does provide some good evidence for proactive interference. The theory of cues represents an alternative theory to that of interference. It's another possible explanation for why we forget things. This theory about forgetting states that being able to remember something depends on getting the right cue. By cue, we mean a trigger which allows us to recall a specific memory, something that leads our brain down the path of recalling that experience or event, smell, sight, set of words. According to this theory, forgetting is an accessibility issue. That memory is still present. It's still there in the brain, buried in the memory somewhere. But if we forget, we can't access it. Our brains can't get to it. Sometimes this is also known as retrieval failure, because although the information is still there stored in our memory, our brain is unable to retrieve it. Cue theory maintains that our ability to remember something depends on these cues. Cues can be external. They can be outside of us, like weather, temperature, smells and sounds. Or they can be internal, our mood at a given time, our feelings at a given time. Q theory also holds that we're much more likely to remember a specific piece of information if we're in the same mood or in the same setting as when we initially learned it. So being in the same place, being in the same mood, being under the same set of conditions as when we first put that memory away. This is often known as dependent learning because our ability to learn and recall that information depends on our circumstances, both external circumstances and our internal circumstances. Q-dependent learning seems a strong theory for how we forget and how we lose information, especially from our long-term memories. It does have a wide range of experimental evidence to back it up. Quite a lot of this evidence has been peer-reviewed, it's repeatable, it's scalable. However, most of this evidence, as with interference theory, came from laboratory experiments. It has limited ecological validity. Q-theory may not apply in the real world. And lastly, one objection is that Q-theory might not apply to all types of memory. We don't know if cues influence our short-term memory. They may not. Th this theory also seems not to apply to our procedural memory, like walking, swimming, or playing instruments. Remembering those doesn't seem to de be dependent on our mood, our feelings, or any external cues like smell and sounds. We can usually just remember the process. In 1971, Tulving and Pasotka carried out a piece of research to establish how we forget from our long-term memories. They were looking at both cue-dependent learning and interference as possible explanations of how we forget, and they were looking to see where these two met and agreed, but also where these two theories disagreed. They may not, for example, have been mutually exclusive. It could be that both present reasonable explanations for how we forget information. 
Each of the participants in this research was given a list of 24 words, either one list, two lists, or all the way up to six lists. Each of these lists was divided up into categories, six sets of four words which were all related, such as oak, ash, beech, fir, all trees, or dog, cat, snake, owl, all animals. After these lists have been handed out, all the participants were divided into two groups. One group was simply asked to recall the words. They were given a pen and paper and asked to write down as many as they could possibly remember. This is also known as total free recall or totally free recall. The second group was given some cues to recall the words. This is known as free cued recall. The first group that had totally free recall showed signs of retroactive interference. They could remember the last list that they'd memorized much better than the first few lists that they'd been given. The newer information had caused them to forget some of the older information. This suggested that later lists had interfered with the ability of participants to recall the earlier ones. But the second group, which had been given cues, had much better recall of on all the lists. The effects of interference hadn't really been present, and recall was a steady 70%. The cues that they'd been given had allowed them to recall about 70% of all the words. The main conclusion that was gained from this piece of research was that interference hadn't caused participants to actually forget. The memories were still there, they were retrievable, and they were available once a cue was given. They were still present, lodged in the memory, but remembering them became a retrieval problem. The brain just had to have a way to get to them. Therefore, the forgetting shown for the first group, which, remember, was tasked with totally free recall, was cue-dependent forgetting. That forgetting could be reversed if a cue was given, which would allow our memories to bring back the information. This experiment was done under laboratory conditions, so there was good control of variables, and it's extremely unlikely that an unknown third outside variable was contaminating the results. But as always with laboratory condition studies, there may have been a lack of ecological validity. It's not possible to generalize these results. We can't say they would always work in the real world because they haven't been tested in the real world. What's notable is that this study also only tested our memories involving words. It's not possible to be sure if the same results and the same conclusions could be made when numbers or images or sights or smells were involved. It may well be the case that how we recall and how we forget is completely different if we're looking at images or numbers or remembering smells. As far as we're aware, there was no ethical issues to this study. Participants were able to give informed consent, they weren't misled, they weren't harmed, and they certainly weren't put under any stressful conditions.